Okay, welcome patriots to Camp Constitution's interview with our dynamic duo, the Patriot Pastor, Garrett Lear, and his fellow compatriot, and tells it like it is, no wiggle room, <laughs> Reverend Stephen Kraft of New Jersey. Uh, starting with you, Reverend Kraft, are you originally from New Jersey, sir? Yes, I, I was born and raised in New Brunswick, New Jersey, October 10th, 1943, in St. Peter's General Hospital. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, so uh, what was it like growing up uh, then in the early days of the Depression, World War II, in that part of the country? Well, I wasn't born during World War II, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, came, I was born in 1943, and oh, during, that, during that time, in America, we as black Americans, we were still under the, the illegal yoke of Jim Crow slavery. Even in How, New Jersey? All through the United States. It, yes. was just, it was just practiced in a different way. Mm -hmm. I can remember right in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is in central New Jersey, three blocks from our house was a major beautiful swimming pool. But on the outside of the swimming pool, it says no colors allowed. And my sister and I, we would have to look through the fence in the sweltering heat yeah. and watch all the Caucasian kids being able to swim, and they would mock us and laugh. Oh, and wow. it, it was a hurtful time. But yeah. in all of that, I had grown up in a Judeo-Christian foundation. Right. All of my life, I went to church, even though I was not saved, but I was religious. I knew in my heart of hearts that the gospel was true. I knew that Jesus Christ was Lord, and even though my people were oppressed under that legal Jim Crow system, I knew in my heart one day that would be justified. So my foundation was set right. Why? Because our nation, the United States of America, was built on the foundation that all human beings right. were created equal by their creator with yes. unalienable rights, the right to life, the right to liberty and right. the right to pursuit of happiness. So I had a good foundation, even though my particular culture at the time was under the yoke of, of illegal laws that right. denied us those rights. And um, in fairness to the founders, they tried to solve that question twice um, at the Declaration of Independence. They could not. They tried again at the Constitution, and they knew this would lead to a lot of problems later on. But they did set that train called America on the train that would move uh, towards freedom, on a track that would move down that way, and, uh, but not without us working for it. And I guess in, in the Bible it says we got to work for these things. You know? Exactly. And see, the problem we have today, because one of the original sins of our great uh, republic was the sin of, of racism and slavery, what has happened? The Bible is clear. The Bible says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yes, and what has happened in America today, from uh, uh, pre-Jim Crow and slavery days till now, what has happened is the shoe of s the sin of slavery and the sin of racism and, and these things of racial hatred and all these have shifted from one race to the other. So now what we have is that same spirit that oppressed the blacks back in the day, now that same spirit is oppressing the whites today. Right. So what we have to do is we have to place ourselves under God, white, black, Hispanic, and we must say we are Americans. Americans first, yes. We are Americans. We are Americans. For example, many of my people in my culture take the title and embrace the title African American. Well, that's really wrong. That's really a misnomer. Why? Because Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent. Yes, sir. Africa is a continent. None of us that are Americans were born in Africa. Yes, sir. We were born in America. Now, black Americans is a legitimate title, right. but African American is not because okay. we are not Africans that happen to come to America. Amen. We are Americans that have an African culture and African heritage. See? Right. So what we have to do now is find people of every ethnicity that think correctly, that love their nation, and that say, first and foremost, we are one nation, Americans, yes. united under God with liberty Indivisible. Ju and justice for all. Yes. We have to do that. And as a black minister, and as a minister of the Black Robe Regiment, this is my message, and this is the reason why 
people like myself, like minded, like you, or Mr. Moore, like the Patriot Priester, uh, uh, yes. uh, uh, Reverend Lear, we have got to go out in one accord. That's why it's so important right. that we we expose salt and pepper. Right. See, to make this thing clear that mm -hmm. there is no division between people who love God versus people who don't. Very good. And uh, so you can say that you were, even though you experienced that discrimination, um, it helped in your character building. It helped in making you a fighter for justice in the long run. Exactly. You know, that's exactly. the way that God shapes us. So we each have those challenges. And now I'm going to shift over to this side to talk about another set of challenges. And that there's one story that I particularly like. Uh, tell us, uh, Patriot Pastor, where were you born and a little bit about your upbringing? Well, I was born in the Lexington. I say the Lexington because when it comes to American history, uh, it's not Lexington, Kentucky or Lexington, Virginia, or Lexington, Tennessee, or Lexington, Ohio, all those places are wonderful, Lexington, Nebraska, where the cradle of American liberty is, or the shot heard around the world. So I mean, actually was born there in 23 Reed Street. Um, I date my birth from my conception, which was in October of 1947. Uh, I do that because I believe that the Lord showed me years ago um, not only from the Bible, but also our foundational documents like the Declaration of American Independence, life, liberty, mm -hmm. and the pursuit of happiness, that our founding fathers were very concerned with life. And if we are not safe in our mother's womb? If we're not safe in our mother's womb, then none of us nobody is safe, safe anywhere. anywhere. And that is proving to be true uh, so much. And of course, the other point, and I'm glad that you brought that out, uh, Tri-Corner Tom, because the issue of the Bill of Rights applies to us all. It's a Bill of Rights and it's not conveyed upon us or bestowed upon us by government. Mm -hmm. There are human rights um, that, that the Lord has endowed us with. And as Americans right. of all people, we should understand that even with our, and as Reverend Kraft has been sharing some of the idiosyncrasies of our culture, right. it's a fallen world that we've had mistakes. The wonderful thing that I'm proud about in America is we have an endeavor to solve these problems. Right. And speaking of your upbringing, before we get off that topic uh, and rights and, and what shaped you as men, um, I'd like to hear that story about your struggle with injustice with the gang in Lexington, how you tried to remedy it in, in several different ways biblically, and what it ultimately came to behind that Minuteman, Minuteman statue. Well, being a lot of people have said, gee, I wish I could be as tall as you. I said, well, it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages. The disadvantage of it was uh, when I was, I could never get away from playing sports. You know, people always would want me to play sports. And I was actually, for a while, a wrestler, a heavyweight wrestler there at Lexington High School. And uh, one day, one of the big, tough guys in town who wanted to prove to his gang that he was tougher than me and he had big biceps and whatever. So he challenged me in the field house in front of all the students and the coaches and whatever to a wrestling match, figuring he was going to pick me up, throw me down, and tear me up. Well, he didn't. I pinned him in 90 seconds, and he was very embarrassed. And so we're running around the field house doing laps. He came up behind me, and he cold cocked me. In other words, he hit me from behind, practically knocked me out. My eye was all swollen, whatever. And what happened was from then, I mean, this guy pursued me, persecuted me, um, all over town. With a gang of people, not just him. People. Never himself, mm -hmm. never alone. And, I mean, he pulled me out of cars. I mean, he, they jumped on me and whatever else. So you were looking for a fight? I wasn't looking for a fight. I, I mean, I've never looked for a fight. I, I, I'm not, it's not really my nature to go looking for a fight. But I always had learned at that point, and it was really how he taught me this. Well, you may not look, be looking for a fight, but a fight comes to you, what do you do you. about it? And one day I was coming out of the Cary Memorial Library right there in the center of Lexington, right in the shadow of John Parker's statue of the Minuteman. And uh, he came and he, he had his boys there, and there was about a dozen of them, and they grabbed me and were pushing me around. And something just welled up inside of me. I mean, maybe it was out of my DNA and out of my heritage as an American, and whatever. And I said to him, you know what? You're a coward. You, you're, not, you're not strong. You know, you're, you're a coward because you can't fight me by yourself. You're going to have all these guys. I don't have any guys. You always pick on me when I'm alone. Where's my friends? I said, if you were any kind of a person, why don't you come over here behind the Minuteman? 
you're telling everybody that you can clean my clock and you can beat me up. Well, take me over there on the green and beat me up. So in a way, you were sort of in the same situation as your ancestors were. These, you know, very brave, small group of men, when a whole regiment comes upon them, and they stand their ground just as you did. And what happened from there, Pastor? Mm -hmm. Three punches, and he was out. Yeah. Right behind the Minuteman statue. Right behind the Minuteman <laughs> statue. And you know the interesting thing about this, and you talk about the manifest destiny of God and how the wheels of God turn slowly, but they turn exceedingly fine, and how things can work out. Little did I know that that guy was being watched by the town police and the police chief, whose name was Chief Corps. Um, the police showed up. They took both, both of us down to the station to hear our stories and whatever else. The police chief took me aside and he said, I just want to thank you. Mm -hmm. This guy is a, is a criminal. He's been doing these kind of harassments to a lot of people. He's dangerous. We've been trying to get something in public you know, that was verified by legitimate witnesses because none of his, his friends there, his gang, are going to testify against him or anything. He said, now we've got it. And you've shown that this guy could be taken. And you're so right, uh, Tom, that on that very green, this is what our Minutemen did. They stood there and said, look, we're not looking for trouble. I mean, it's right there on the stone that John Parker said. Mm -hmm. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Mm -hmm. And that's what's in my heart. As a Christian, that's in my heart. Mm -hmm. As a man of God, that's in my heart. As an American, that's in my heart. I want to live in peace. I don't want anyone to be hurt. I love people. I care about them. But, at but the we're duty-bound to take a stand against evil when confronted with it. That's right. Yes. And why should I stand? And you know, I've said this to the young people, and it's hard even for me to understand. What does it mean to turn the other cheek? Well, let me tell you something. I'm thanking the Lord that I can see out of my right eye, although my right eye has never been as good as my left eye because of that guy hitting me mm. in the face from behind. Right. Mm. He didn't even come front on. He had to hit me from behind. Mm. See? Mm -hmm. And so, standing the ground, the police chief said, thank you very much, now we have what we need to put him where he belongs, in jail. Mm -hmm. And here we fast forward to yes, April 19, 2013, and I'm standing, and you were with me, talking to the police chief, Mark Corp. Yes. The son of that police chief mm -hmm. from back in whatever that was, in 19, I was uh -huh. about 14, 15 years old, so 1963. Yes. And the Lord was working through him, I believe, and because the selectmen this past April 19th were, uh, we were having a patriot gathering there and commemorating those, of course, that fell on the green and commemorating our nation and saying prayers uh, for a new great awakening in this nation. And it just seemed like the devil was doing anything he can to stop that from happening. But uh, we were able to, and you especially, talking to that chief and those captains, and we were able, and they were, we came over to our side. And although we were not able to gather on the green, we were able to have that ceremony and, and, and honor our God and, and those patriots. So, you know, the, it really says to me, don't be in a rush. Mm -hmm. Do what you're made to do. I certainly didn't realize those things at that time. I was just a kid. I was just right. a teenager. Little did I know that I was going to turn out to be like that statue, like John Parker. <laughs> right. That I was the Lord had me lead parades in the Army. I carried the United States Army flag, right. I and mean, even though I was trained for combat and everything, they liked me to carry the Army flag to lead the parade right. and so forth. Because when one man st stands up, he stiffens other men's spines. Yes. That's what we're called yes. to do. That's what that dining Very good. I was doing. In yeah. all cultures, in all colors, and by the way, I only consider this one race. It's called the human race. Yeah. It comes yes. in many different yeah. colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's one race, and the Lord is doing this thing, raising people up in our country to realize, you know, we need to stand our ground. And people all over the world, and you know, Tom, you've been there on Lexington Green, they, they come here from all over the world, and they want to be mm -hmm. at the yes, cradle of absolutely. American liberty. They mm -hmm. want to be at that place. You go up there to Concord Bridge. They want to be there, and, and, and you see their eyes. They want to believe that it's That's possible right. mm -hmm. that they can live truly as the way that the Lord has made them. Mm -hmm. And so Amen. I'm honored to be able to be in that position and say, and I used to complain of being too tall. I mean, when I went to first grade at Fisk Elementary School in Lexington, they sent me to the sixth grade. Yes. I said, I'm not a sixth grader. I never now, even been to this school before. Uh, oh, no, you're a sixth uh, grader, as big as you are. Why don't you go ahead and stand up here. So you are six foot seven. Then uh, with those buckled shoes, probably another couple inches, and then probably a few more with the hat. So pretty close to seven feet tall. <laughs> Am I standing up nice and straight? Uh, is his head even in the shot? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
because I want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. I was so ashamed of being tall because people ridiculed me when I was young. They sent me to posture class. That's in the days before they thought it was verbally abusive to say stand up, you know, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, they sent me to posture class. And I still would walk around like this. It wasn't until I got right. to the military academy and they came over and said, you'll stand up. You'll stand in attention until you learn to stand up. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to have to stand up. Right. You know, make a good target. Right? Very good, sir. Okay, we'll sit back down. And you mentioned the call. So that's the next thing we're going to get to is talk about the call. Now, it's funny. Every really wonderful pastor that's inspired me has been taken to the Lord, kicking and screaming, like, no, Lord, no, don't, 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 uh, don't, don't give me that responsibility, but those are seemed like some of the best pastors. And uh, there's, I guess someone wrote a book that said uh, the best horses were wild stallions in their youth. And uh, so going back to uh, Pastor Kraft, do you want to talk about exactly the circumstances and how you got the call to our Lord and Savior's mission? Yes, it was like Pastor Lear said. When one man stands up, just one man, he stiffens many other men's spines. I was a drug addict, a heroin addict, shot dope every day when I came out of, out of Vietnam from 1967 to 1976. Why? Because I had that inferiority complex that was fostered onto me by believing the devil's lie about you're black, you're second class. I believed that lie and I medicated myself with hard narcotics to dull the pain. One day as I sat in jail and God began to deal with me, have I not said, Stevie Kraft, that I created you in my own image and after my own likeness and I am the Lord thy God and I do not create junk and say not that what God says is clean, like he told Peter on the roof at Cornelius' house, that you dare say is unclean. And I said, yes, Lord. He said, look at in the mirror at yourself. You are created in the image of God. And I came out of that jail, and I began to believe who I really was, rather than listen to the voices of, the, of men who said something that I was not. And I knew I was called to preach because I knew I was called to preach the gospel when I was five years old. I can remember I used to preach to my sister when they had the old Pepsi, uh, uh, Coca-Cola little bottles and the little wooden uh, uh, crates they came in. I'd make a pulpit out of the crate, sit her down in front and preach to her. So I always had a preach in me. But the thing of it was, once I got grown and I took on all these evil attitudes because of sin, I didn't want to hear anything about preaching. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear, I'm getting out the army, I'm going to New York with my first cousin, I'm going to kick up my heels, I'm going to shoot dope, I'm going to get those pretty ladies, I'm going to do my thing. Don't tell me nothing, no Jesus, no church, no, I don't want to hear preaching, I don't want to hear that. And that's just what I did. But God was faithful because my brother, Gary Sanford Kraft, my f two first cousins, Herschel Frank Howard and Jimmy Van Dyne, uh, Jimmy the Weasel Van Dyne, all three of us were shooting heroin every day. Jimmy is dead, Gary is dead, and Herschel is dead. They weren't doing anything that I wasn't doing. They're dead. Yes, sir. And only the grace of God kept Stevie Lewis Kraft alive because God knew my heart, and the Bible says the things that God foreknows. He sanctifies. Praise the Lord. God sanctified me. He foreknew me. He foreknew that one day I would give my heart truly to Jesus Christ, that I'd get past the religiosity of the Baptist church and traditions of men and all these things, and that yes. I would be a true minister of the gospel. He raised me up. I got myself clean in 1978, never put another needle in my arm from that day to this. Praise the Lord. Went to Bible College, Central Bible College, Springfield, Missouri, graduated yes. in 1989. Went then to Harvard University School of Divinity, graduated yes. in 1996 with a Master's in Divinity, and then God sent me right back to Missouri, to the capital of Missouri, Jefferson Great. City, to work. One question before we move on. So my ancestor, Thomas Dudley, was a founder of Cambridge and Harvard University, along with his neighbor, John Harvard. 
He was the mm -hmm. governor who signed the charter to Harvard University, and their original miss mission statement was Veritas Christo mm -hmm. et Ecclesiae, mm -hmm. which means the truth of Christ, who is the truth, mm -hmm. for his church. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, in 1843, when the Unitarians took over, Jesus was removed from the motto, at least pub the public displays on the mm -hmm. motto. Mm -hmm. And uh, so can you tell us, and Harvard is so important educationally, yeah. everything yeah. Oh, flows yeah. down from Harvard oh, in yeah. this nation, oh, yeah. has always been the leader. Oh, yeah. What did you find? Was your face re reinforced? Was a challenge? What did you find at Harvard Divinity School? It was reinforced and challenged okay. at the same time. It was challenged because I knew what I was getting into when I got accepted to go there. Right. See, the whole motif of Harvard is when ethnicities, when uh, Hispanic or black ethnicities come into Harvard University, right. they want to flip them into a world philosophy of Marxism, socialism, and liberalism. Even if they're at the Divinity School? Yeah, the Divinity School is the main purveyor of that mess. <laughs> because if they can get you to believe a theological lie about religion, then the rest of it is, is a cakewalk. Right. <laughs> when they accepted me, they thought, oh, he's going to be a good one. Oh, he can preach. We'll, we'll, we'll make him the next Jesse Jackson. I got up in there, and they found out, oh, he's one of them black conservative Bible thumping. Oh, we got to get rid of him. They worked on me for three years. My first advisor in my first year in the MDiv program was a woman, I won't call her name because she's probably still up there. I know she's tenured. But she was a, a staunch feminist lesbian. And I'm a black conservative Bible-believing preacher. So you knew how we flew. Right. We had a problem from Jump Street. <laughs> she was determined to get rid of me. And I was determined I wasn't going anywhere because God opened the door. So we went back and forth, but she wasn't able to get, get rid of me, put me on academic prob probation, but God sent another professor there, who I will call, whose name was Arthur Dyke. He is now retired, I believe. He was an evangelical Christian. Right. He helped me to maneuver through that madness of the three years on the MD, right. and I was able to graduate. As a result of that, and I'm, my name is blacklisted, at Harvard, if you go up there tonight and say, you wow. remember a, a crazy black preacher named Reverend Stevie Kraft graduated in the class in 1996? I said, yeah, we know him. We know all about him. <laughs> that you can take to the bank. But anyway, I went out to Missouri, went into the Department of Corrections, and, and was the chaplain for seven years at the Missouri State Penitentiary, right. where God took me right back into that environment, working with other hardcore criminals, Teaching them the truth about Jesus Christ. And saving them by the power of that Holy Spirit. Ex that's it. It's the only thing exactly. And saving. now, since I left there, what I'm doing is a lot of speaking on these issues because most people today are deceived. Most people really do not under most people have no knowledge of what this country was based on. They right. have no knowledge of the foundation of this country. Right. That's why you can have people who have come to America right. or who are born in America who have prospered and taken advantage of the prosperity and fruits of America, right. and yet have the audacity in the same breath, hate America. How can that be? Well, I can tell you, Pastor, unequivocally, Reverend, that my ancestor and his ancestors that founded this country and those institutions, you are exactly the kind of minister they wanted to produce. You are exactly what Harvard started out as, yeah. and hopefully we'll get back to. And uh, we'll get back to that question. So now, Talking about the call, everybody gets called to preach in different ways, and who knows, there might be somebody out there that's that, that's in the pits of hell right now that, that'll make a great uh, preacher too one day. Pastor Lear, what was your experience in getting the call to the Lord to preach His Word? Uh, at a family dinner at my house where there was a lot of arguing going on, um, I just was so disconcerted about that of the family having that kind of attitude, I went in my room and I was sitting at the end of my bed. I was six years old. And I just, God, why am I in this family? How did I end up here? And I'm not saying that if you were sitting in the room with me, you would have heard a voice, but I heard a voice say to me, you're mine, you belong to me. Mm -hmm. And I have something for you to do. And it was interesting because I looked out my window, 37 Coolidge Avenue in Lexington, and there was an oak tree there and it was like, branches were waving at me like this. That stuck with me and, and a lot of what uh, Reverend Kraft has shared as his testimony is interesting. <coughs> I never hit up heroin or anything like that, but I certainly did a lot of drinking um, and drugs and of course a lot of ch chasing skirts. I mean, I didn't end up in Vietnam. I had gone through the military academy and got commissioned and 
uh, thought I was going to be ending up in combat as a platoon leader in Vietnam and got injured at Fort Bragg and they decided to discharge me. So I said, well, people have been telling me a big guy like you ought to go to Hollywood. So I went to Hollywood and next thing I know, I'm you know, in the thick of that and the opportunity to uh, try out for the... Not exactly group. the most Christian town in America. Not at all. I mean, and it's worse now, I'm sure, but it was really bad even then in the early 70s. Um, and I was up for the part of Superman, the Christopher Reeve. <laughs> decided I didn't really want to do that. It was a little weird for a you know, native New Englander <laughs> like me there in Hollywood, so I decided to go backpacking in Hawaii. Always wanted to go there. And that's really where, you know, and I had been raised um, somewhat religiously. <coughs> I won't say my parents too much, but, you know, around the extended family. I am a descendant of several preachers. Uh, but, you know, some of my family was Roman Catholic. I was actually christened in the Episcopal Church. I was uh, confirmed as a teenager. I was youth leader. I didn't know Christ as my Lord and Savior. Um, knew very little bit about the Bible. but. You know, it's just interesting to see how the Lord puts a call on your life there and fulfills it even in this <coughs> a lot of times when I was doing crazy stuff um, and, and endangering my own life. It's like something would come over me and I know it was the hand of the Lord saying, go to bed, in the morning you get up, you'll be better. And But the day came when the Lord, while I was in Hawaii, saying, you know what, you've been leading people astray, you're more like a guru than you are you know, a real leader like that of... of for Christians and leading in a godly way, and I really had to make a decision, and I am convinced, and that was at the end of the 70s, and I'm convinced that if I had not accepted Christ as my Savior right then to fulfill the calls on my life, I would, probably would have died mm. right wow. about then, mm. because it was like I was leading people astray, <clears throat> giving them the attitude that many of the liberal leftist um, people in a lot of the churches do now, oh yeah, anything you want to do is fine. Let it all hang out. It's okay. I mean, because God's love, right? right? Which obviously He is. And there is the scripture that tells us God is love. But we also know that He's a righteous God. He's mm -hmm. a holy God. And he, he says, I want to make you holy. And you can't do that on your own. That's only through Christ. And so uh, when I accepted the Lord, the first thing that I had a hunger for, okay, instantaneously, I had no more hu hunger for smoking cigars, cigarettes booze, drugs, or anything like that. I just wanted to read the Word of God. Wow. And the first year that I knew Christ as my Savior, and people ask me, and I've been through Bible college, I've been through some graduate school, because I had a Bachelor of Arts degree from Vanderbilt University in, in the speech and in, in the department, speech and drama department there. None of that means anything. The thing mm -hmm. that meant the most to me is 12 times in the first year I was saved, I read the Bible. Mm -hmm. wow. Genesis 1-1 one, one to Revelation 22-21. Before long, I mean, I've read the Bible through hundreds of times. I've read it in 18 different translations. I've studied it as best I could in Aramaic, Syriac, Hebrew, Chaldee, and so forth and so on, much of which has been mentored by other people who know the Lord, studying in a variety of different ways every single day, never missing a day right. in all those many years. And the Lord has done a marvelous thing. Mm -hmm. to, because it's a wonderful thing to know that you're not here by accident. Right. My mother died drunk in a car accident, and I thought probably that's going to help help me. My, I mean, it happened to me. My father probably would have died drunk, although he was not the same kind of drunk. He was successful in business, as a lot of my family were, but they were you know, drinking all the time. My father went to heaven from his deathbed uh, because he accepted Christ on his deathbed in the hospital with me leading him mm -hmm. to the Lord. And so everyone is here, whether they think they were born mm -hmm. out of accident or not, nobody's right. an accident. Right. God has a manifest destiny for us. It's a God incident, it's a consequence. Right. And I'm just honored, my, my greatest honor here is to come to places like Camp Constitution, look out to these young people mm -hmm. and say, you know what? Don't be foolish, don't live that kind of life, don't be sold on, you know, the party hardy life, because you may not know, and I had to tell my own children this. You may not survive, just the way um, Brother Kraft has been sharing here about the three people in that there were dead, brothers, yes. cousins, and stuff. I've got lots of people, too. I mean, the issue of even in Vietnam, I, a lot of my friends, their name's on the wall. Yes. Why I get spared? Because mm -hmm. I went through Special Forces training. I was A plus 201 file. They spent four years and money on me and everything else, 
and I don't go to Vietnam. Mm, right? Right. That was the hand of the Lord because I probably would have gotten over there and stepped on a punji stake or blown up with a clay mm. or turned the wrong direction mm. or something. So people, and I hope this gets across in our interview, this right. camp constitution is so important. Yes. Because not only does it teach true biblical Christianity, but we're teaching that our country was started by Christians, the right. only Christian nation in history. And you read the Mayflower Compact, you've got to know that. Right. And they te teach here at this camp about our foundational organic documents, mm -hmm. of which the Declaration and the Constitution are certainly very primary documents. Yeah. And so what an honor it is to do that, and I'm just well, thankful. Well, that leads to my next question. I'm, I'll start it on this side and then move it that side because it's flowing right out of your um, your last passage, and um, and that is the concept of a great awakening. So my question for both of you and you first is, what were were those first great awakenings? The first two were pretty major. One was before the revolution; it led to the revolution. How did that like rip through the congregations? And what were the pastors like that were moving around this land? And how did we get this consciousness of a union, of being one country and not separate colonies? And then how can we get that back? How can we set out off such another great awakening to the power, truth, and love of Jesus Christ in 2013? What would that look like? Is that possible? I have to pray and believe it is. But uh, you first, Pastor, what did it look like then and what's it going to look like now? Because you preach for a great awakening and those who want to see it, go to Water from the Well at YouTube uh, and the Patriot Pastor Speaks, Lexington, uh, April 19th, 2013, Year of Our Lord, Anno Domini. I was there. It was a great honor. And I hope this great awakening catches on. I, I have some doubts. But what did it look like then and what's it going to look like now if we can get it back? Yes. That's the answer to your very comprehensive question, and now let me flesh out the yes part. Is it possible for a Great Awakening? Of course. I mean, the power of Almighty God, and if you go to Mount Vernon and see that George Washington believed in the resurrection of Christ, he had it etched in his tomb right there in granite. The power of the resurrection, now that may not be good science in some people's estimation, but it is good theology and it is true. So if the Lord can change us in the twinkling of an eye, if he can take those dead bones and dry bones mm -hmm. and bring them back to life, if he can take those that are, have been gone for a long time and they're nothing but dust and ashes in the earth and bring them back to life, well yeah. certainly he can uh, yeah. revive his church. The thing, we're under judgment right now, aren't we? Well, there's always judgment because mm -hmm. God is not only our Savior, but if you look at Isaiah 33, 22, he is also our judge and he's our lawgiver. Mm -hmm. right. And so at the same time, while he's always willing to offer mercy, he is he's judging. There's judgment built in. Mm -hmm. Because when people are sinning, they're bringing the judgment upon themselves. But mm -hmm. the Lord is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we'll confess them mm -hmm. and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, what mm -hmm. we're told in Scripture. So the First Great Awakening, and this is a point of the First Great Awakening. I have many times read to people, narrated the sinners in the hands of an angry God. God. Mm -hmm. People don't like that kind of talk Jonathan in 2013. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you something. They didn't like him back in Northampton. Right. Right. They yeah. fired him from his church. Mm -hmm. But you read that, and the first time that I ever read it, I said, if I wasn't already saved, mm -hmm. two things would have happened. One of two things would have happened. I either would have gotten saved when I read this thing, or I'd be really upset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the gospel is an offense to those who oh, perish. Yeah. But what happened to that first great awakening, a lot of people don't realize, was it had a lot to do with the Salem Witch Trials. Mm -hmm. right. There was tremendous uh, tragedy that happened there. Lies were told. The enemy had a real foothold. Good people were persecuted. People were executed and so forth. And one of the women that were in the, the, the Pilgrim Puritan Church there who lied through her teeth for whatever reason. She didn't even know why she was doing it. The enemy had a control over her. This woman left the town and traveled the whole country. She never got married. And, of course, being a barren woman, so to speak, um, in those days in particular, had not having any children, no family to, to support you Stigma. later in your life, was a stigmatized. She came back to that very church when she repented. She said, I don't know what I did, but it was wrong. I lied. Lord, forgive me. That started the first great awakening, not just the preaching of Jonathan Edwards. And then we go to other great awakenings. The thing that I try to encourage people today is, if you got to be awakened, that means you went to sleep. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm awakened. Mm -hmm. You're awakened. Mm -hmm. The nation. He's awakened. Fortunately. We're, the, the three of us sitting here, we're awakened. Yeah, amen. 
We're fire starters. But our nation... Many of the people in our nation are asleep, and some of them will stay asleep, but mm -hmm. it doesn't take a majority to prevail. It just takes an irate minority willing to set brush fires mm -hmm. in men's minds. So said Samuel Adams. And when he's looking at the situation, gee, everybody doesn't want to break off from Great Britain. Everybody doesn't want to go in this war for independence. Right. And so the issue of whatever number of Great Awakening we need, it's not only needed, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And what do I advise people to do? First and foremost thing is, is get on your face, get on your knees, pray fast, seek the face of the Lord, what Second Chronicles 7.14 mm -hmm. says. And there's elements there. Now, I'm not a legalist, and I'm not somebody who's a formula man, but if the Lord says you need to, if, if the, my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I forgive their sins from heaven, and then will I hear their prayers, and I will heal their land. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we're not going to get that. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, we're not going to get that. So if people are saying, you know what, gee, I'm blasé, life doesn't mean anything. I am so excited with life, so much to do, the passion of living and so forth and so on is great. I mean, I should probably be retired and out to pasture right now. Instead, I'm being refired, and I'm mm -hmm. out to pastor. Mm -hmm. Amen. Pastor, anybody in America wants to get pastored, I'll pastor you. Mm -hmm. you want to be, you're a patriot and a Christian, I'll pastor you. Mm -hmm. But don't expect me to be Casper Milk Toast, and don't expect me not mm -hmm. to tell you what the Word of God says or what is the truth about it, because that would make me not a good pastor. Mm -hmm. I couldn't lead the Black Robe Regiment, mm -hmm. and I would be disgraced to those who came before us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And see, the wonderful thing that we can be the dynamic duo. And I'm proud to be on that t-shirt that that man over there is wearing yeah. of the two of us. Because let me tell you something. It's a fulfillment of scripture and it makes the true America. Every color and every tongue and every tradition. And years ago, and it probably opened my eyes, I mean, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, in Northampton, New Hampshire. I don't think I saw a person who was actually of any other skin color years I had a friend who was half Chinese and that was about it until the later years when I went uh, down to Philadelphia and whatever else so it never really occurred to me until I went to Hawaii and I preached there and, and I was in a church service and I looked out over the t and I said this is like heaven there are people that are Chinese and Mexican and Puerto Rican and Hawaiian and Tongan and Filipinos and, mm -hmm. and people I don't even know where they come from, Fijian Island and everything, and they're all worshiping the Lord together. I said, mm -hmm. that looks like heaven to me. Mm -hmm. That looks wow. like what the Lord has prophesied in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See? Excellent. And that's what the Lord's doing. He can do that here in America. But where right. does it start? Everybody's waiting for it to happen at the White House. <laughs> yeah. Or they're waiting for it to happen at the State House. Or they're happening. Uh -huh. No, let it happen at your house. It can't from come from without. It has to come from within. That's right. First. It's organic, and mm -hmm. it, it starts uh, on the grassroots level and goes up. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, instead of the idea, let's change up here. Everybody's waiting for something. Don't wait for anyone else. And the wonderful thing is this: even if other people won't go, we used to sing. In the old days, we used to sing the song. Though no mm -hmm. none go with me, mm -hmm. still I will follow. Yes. Though none go with me, still I will follow. And that's my commitment. Mm -hmm. If Amen. America's decided not to serve Christ, I'm not included in that. I'm going to serve yes. him if I'm the only American serving him. And thanks mm -hmm. be to God, I'm not the only American. And like what the Lord said to Elijah, when Elijah had mm -hmm. a tremendous victory on Mount Carmel, comes down, goes into the depression, goes and hides in a cave. And the Lord says, what's the matter with you, Elijah? Come out of that cave. Mm -hmm. I'll feed you. You need some rest, you're tired out. Yeah, but Jezebel wants to kill me, and Ahab wants to kill me. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that. I'm the only one serving you. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. There's 7,000 mm -hmm. in this land. Well, let me tell you something. I've traveled from the east to the west, the north to the south. I know this country. I love America. Don't try to mm -hmm. talk me out of not loving America. I love this country, mm -hmm. and I know this country. Mm -hmm. And we got a whole lot more than 7,000 mm -hmm. that have not yeah. bowed their knee mm -hmm. to Baal in this country. And I'm calling on them, come on out, stand up, say what needs to be said, and don't be afraid. How many times are you going to say, don't be afraid? Yeah. Or 2 Timothy 1, 7, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. That will be equal to yes. the first chapter of Joshua that says, be of good courage, be of good courage, be of good courage, be of good courage. Amen. And Reverend Kraft, the gates of your esteemed university, as a quote from Proverbs about righteousness. Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness will exalt 
a nation. But sin, that's the contrast, is a reproach to any people. So if I would paraphrase that, I would say righteousness under God will exalt America and sin under God will bring America down. So how do we bring that back to your alma mater in specific and to America in general? What the vision that I have that I want to see God, if he so wills it, and I believe he does, to bring all of us together is to see a spiritual revival happen right there in that prestigious university. Yes. Harvard University. In fact, I would like to see it right there in the midst of Harvard Yard, right in front of the bus of John Harvard as he sits there in Harvard Yard with that big black Bible that's sitting on his lap. I would love for us to be right there, have it go out on national television around the world that Harvard, that was started out of the truth of Christ and the church, be once again resurrected. God can do that. And as the Bible says, if God wills, we know he wills because he says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance. And my prayer is, again, scripture. What Pastor Lear was saying, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles seven fourteen is our remedy. If my people, if it's conditional, who is God's people? Those who profess His name. What's His name in the New Covenant in Greek? Christ. If my people, the Christians who are called by my name, will do what? Humble themselves, not the world, the church, and do what? Pray. Pray for what? Revival. And do what? Seek his face. How do we seek his face? In his word. And do what? Repent. Turn yes. from all wicked ways. Yes. God says if we do those four things, he'll do the three supernatural things. God says if you do that, church, I'll hear from heaven. I will forgive your sins. And I will heal your land. That's three. Four and three is seven. That's God's perfect number. So our prayer we, as we conclude this interview is simply this. Let this interview go viral. God, nothing is too hard for the Lord, the Bible says. Lord, take this humble video here in Ringe, New Hampshire at Camp Constitution. And Lord, by your grace and mercy, send it viral. Not only in the United States of America, but around the world. And let those who love Christ, those who love truth, those who love liberty come forth like they came forth in days of old and say, we want to embrace truth. And truth is Christ. For Christ says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except by me. Amen. Amen. And that sounded like a prayer to me. And uh, uh, Pastor Lear, how about a prayer from you as we close out as well? Well, Father, you have told us very emphatically in your word, and we believe it is your word, the Holy Bible, that where sin abounds, grace the more abounds. Yes. We know that, as you've said in Ephesians chapter 6, it's a spiritual war. Yes. We're in a war. Yes. This is not a playground. This is a battlefield. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the victory. Thank you. You've told us in the last part of the book of Romans, we're more than conquerors. Yes. Not because of how cool we are, how smart we are, how pretty we are or how rich we are or how prosperous we are but because you have called a people to yourself that would yes. be a remnant that would say you are King Jesus yes and we thank you also as we are very close to that area that's known as the place where the shot was heard round the world let this shot be heard round the world yes. that Jesus Christ is the only way the only truth and the only life and no one cometh to the Father but by the Son and it's in your name we gladly, and nobody has to persecute us or force us to say it. Nobody's going to keep us by persecution or force from saying it. Jesus Christ, in your name, we amen and amen. 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 Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, God bless and Godspeed. And hopefully, uh, if you were, uh, if, I, if anyone out there in uh, YouTube, Internet land, was um, inspired by these folks and want to learn a little more, well, it's on mine. Uh, can you please give out your websites? Yeah, actually, he's not recording it. Oh, well, mine is. Mine is. Oh, yours yeah. is. Okay. No, his, so, no, his yeah. is good. His is good. Um, there are several you can go to, but for today, we'll say thepatriotpastor.org. .org. That's and thepatriotpastor.org. Mine, mine is Christian Citizenship Ministries Incorporated.com. Uh, well, not Incorporated. Christian Citizenship 
ChristianCitizenshipMinistries.com. And you're probably watching this on CampConstitution.net, but if not, that's where we are. Thank you so so much, folks. God bless and God bless America. Excellent. Amen.